and welcome back to our coverage of Great Lakes Week. I'm Christy McDonald. Joining me now here on GreatLakesNow.org is Gary Wilson. He's a commentator with the Great Lakes Echo. Gary, how are you? I'm well, I'm well. Good. We're, we're we in are, the home stretch. We are in the home stretch. It's been a great conference, four days long, and what we're waiting for the next session to start right now is actually talking about the Presidential Candidate Forum, the politics involving the environment. And obviously, anytime you're talking about the politics, you're talking about funding. They need to get from Washington to make some of these uh, things happen. So that's going to be coming up in just a in just a short bit. I wanted to talk to you, Gary, though, about some of the enthusiasm that's surrounding. This is the second year of all of these various groups, the government agencies and also environmental groups getting together. Uh, do we start to see um, everyone on the same page now when you have two years of, of, of getting together that it's moving forward with one message instead of fragmented messages from all different sides. I, I think so, Christy. I, I did an interview for uh, Public Radio in Detroit yesterday, and that was that was one of the comments and the questions of all of these disparate groups that uh, they seem to be hanging together. Uh, they they are pretty much on on the same page. When you've got you know, all these various factions, you're you're in, invariably going to have some little minor deviations. But overall, they hold it together pretty well. I, I, I said earlier, the enthusiasm level is still, is still high. Uh, there was a time about f three or four years ago at this conference when it was just the Healing Our Waters conference as a standalone. And uh, it was way up in Duluth, Minnesota. I happen to like Minnesota. There you go. But it's a ways. We do too. It uh, is a ways. It's we a ways. love it. And uh, they were concerned about some drop off. And I think they had just a little bit, but uh, they've recovered. And it's a very strong, it's a very strong faction. So we're going to go right now to that presidential candidate forum and see where the candidates stand on Great Lakes issues. Polls that demonstrated that fact. The Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition is also nonpartisan, but that doesn't mean that we have to ignore the fact that a presidential election is taking place. So just as we did four years ago, the Healing Our Waters Coalition invited the campaigns of both presidential candidates to participate in this conference through a candidate forum. The campaigns were each invited to send a representative to the forum to explain their candidates' views on the Great Lakes and the issues that face the lakes. The coalition since then has had multiple contacts with both campaigns about the event, which is right now. We have, both campaign, we have sent both campaigns the identical materials, including ground rules, logistics, and a briefing memo providing the coalition's viewpoint on key Great Lakes issues. In other words, we have been and will continue to be scrupulously nonpartisan as we put on this event. The Obama campaign has sent Ms. Browner, who I will introduce in a moment, to be its representative. The Romney campaign is not sending a representative. Let me go over the ground rules that we provided to both campaigns. We will follow the same ground rules and logistics and ask the questions in the same way we told the candidates' campaigns we would, even though the circumstances are different than we believed they would be. And we thank, again, Ms. Browner, for being here and agreeing to be part of this forum under these changed circumstances. The purpose of the forum is for 30 million Americans who rely on the Great Lakes and their leaders to learn where the presidential candidates stand on Great Lakes issues. Ms. Browner will have the opportunity to explain her candidates' views generally on the Great Lakes and then answer specific questions on Great Lakes issues from the moderator, that would be me, and the audience. Audience questions will be written on cards and turned in to Healing Our Water staff. Um, you've already turned in some questions, and Chad, if you want to wave back there, other questions or card, turn your cards back into Chad. He will look at those cards. Because of time limitations, we may not be able to answer all the questions that audience members turn in. We will not ask questions that are off topic or too specialized for um, any candidate representative to, to, to answer. Candidate, the candidate representative is asked to focus her comments on Great Lakes issues. Here's the format. Uh, Ms. Browner will have up to 10 minutes to present her candidate's position regarding Great Lakes issues. Um, I'll ask Ms. Browner um, two to three questions about um, President Obama's positions on Great Lakes issues of concern to the region. Um, she'll have up to three minutes to answer each question. I may ask brief follow-up questions, and she'll have two minutes to answer each of those. Then I'll read questions or cards submitted by the audience and the candidate, and, and she'll have two minutes to answer each one of those. Um, and of course, Ms. Browner may make a closing statement up to three minutes, and then the forum will conclude. As I said, we are following the same ground rules we would have um, had both candidates sent a representative here, um, a, even though the circumstances are different than we believe they would be. 
Now, I'd like to introduce Ms. Browner. And then Ms. Browner is a senior counselor at Albright Stonebridge Group and a distinguished senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. Ms. Browner also serves on the board of the League of Conservation Voters on the, and on Bloomberg Government's advisory board. Ms. Browner most recently served as assistant to President Obama and director of the White House Office of Energy and Climate Change Policy, where she oversaw the coordination of environmental, energy, climate, transport, and related policy across the federal government. From 1993 through 2001, Ms. Browner served as the administrator of the EPA. From 1991 through 1993, Ms. Browner served as the Secretary of Environmental Regulation in Florida. Again, thank you for joining us, Ms. Browner. And now we're going to... Should be on. Okay. Good morning. And um, thank you all for the opportunity to, uh, to be here. And um, thank you for what you do uh, in your communities, uh, in your state, in your businesses, in your organizations uh, to help protect and, and, and uh, make sure everything possible is done for the uh, Great Lakes. Um, as you heard, I am here today. Um, my title, I think, is surrogate uh, for the Obama campaign. As you heard in the introduction, I've had a lot of titles in my life. There was Secretary of the Environment for the state of Florida. Uh, when I went to mortgage, get a mortgage on a house in Florida, uh, the, the woman whose title was also Secretary processing the loan guarantee, wanted to know how I made so much money as a secretary. She clearly didn't understand that I had 700 employees and a lot of uh, uh, laws to enforce. Uh, then I went to um, uh, the White House uh, most recently, uh, where my title was assistant uh, to uh, the president. That's the highest rank office uh, in the White House. Uh, but the press decided to title me the socialist Zarina, leaving you to wonder what they didn't understand about history. I don't think there were any actual socialist czars in our history, uh, in the history of the world. But I have to say my favorite title uh, was the title administrator. Uh, again, no one really understood what an administrator is, uh, but the opportunity uh, to work with the 15,000 plus people uh, that make up the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, to be a part of implementing this country's environmental laws was uh, really a, a true uh, honor, and I uh, continue to this day to be very proud of, of the progress uh, we were able to make during my tenure at EPA. It's great to see Dave Ulrich here, who was one of the uh, regional administrators during uh, my tenure. And uh, certainly, uh, I am proud of the work that EPA did during that time and continues to do today uh, on behalf of the uh, Great Lakes. Um, as you know, this is a candidate uh, form or a, a debate. I'm not sure what it is now. Uh, but I'm here to talk about the president, President Obama, and um, his commitment uh, to the Great uh, Lakes. Um, I think if you, the best way to judge somebody is to look at their record, to look at what they've actually done over a period of time. And I think the president's record is really quite uh, significant. He understands um, that the Great Lakes are home to some of America's finest beaches, uh, world-class fisheries, and some of the world's most popular uh, tourist destinations. Uh, that the Great Lakes supply uh, drinking water for uh, 30 million uh, people, and that there are there is a robust uh, industry depending on the health of the Great Lakes. Um, we also understand, he also understands, that the stewardship and the health of the Great Lakes is intrinsically linked to environmental sustainability, human health, national prosperity, and security. And that's why he's taken the steps that he has taken. I probably don't need to tell all of you what those steps are, but I think it's worth just briefly mentioning um, a few. Uh, the first is the historic investments, the financial investments in the Great Lake uh, restoration. Uh, more than a billion dollars uh, since uh, the president uh, took office. Um, thank you. Um, obviously, there is the, the focus on the CARP, on the Asian CARP, and there he has uh, been funding uh, those efforts to better understand how we can actually uh, deal with that problem, how we can prevent the spread 
uh, of the Asian carp. He's also taken actions outside of uh, the, the, the precise focus of the Great Lakes that are important to the health of the Great Lakes, and perhaps most significant among those is the work that uh, Administrator Jackson, Lisa Jackson at EPA did uh, to set the mercury uh, air pollution standard. We all understand that the mercury comes out of the smokestacks, it falls into our rivers, lakes, and streams, into our fish, and can become a serious uh, issue for, for public health. And I think the administration, and particularly Administrator Jackson, deserves a huge amount of credit uh, for, for the uh, leadership she took in setting a, the first ever national mercury standard uh, for coal-fired uh, power plants. You know, as we look to the future, as we, we, we look past uh, the election, uh, clearly the president will continue to provide important leadership. Uh, as you all are keenly aware, he has already asked uh, that the, the study in terms of uh, how best to manage the Asian carp be expedited. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is, is working uh, to do that. That will provide some very, very important insights in terms of next steps uh, to be taken to, to build on the steps that have been taken. So again, um, I'm really here, I guess, now to answer your questions. Um, and I appreciate that opportunity on behalf of the Obama-Biden campaign. And again, I appreciate everything uh, you do. Uh, let me just make a, a personal note in closing. Um, I'm from Florida, as you heard, and I suspect um, what is true for me is true for all of you. Uh, one of the reasons um, I committed my life to environmental protection and have worked in this field uh, since I left law school was because of a special place that inspired me, and that was the uh, National Everglades Park, a, a beautiful place that is threatened uh, daily. And I s suspect for many of you, the Great Lakes has similarly inspired your commitment uh, to uh, the environment, and it is those most beautiful places uh, that continues, I think, to inspire people to think about how we go about protecting our environment, how we protect uh, the health of our children, the health of our communities. You know, the environment is not just a pretty place we visit uh, on our vacation. It's where we live our lives and how we live our lives. And so thank you uh, for your commitment to the environment. Thank you, Ms. Browner. Mm -hmm. I've got a few questions to ask now, and then we'll, we have a few from, from the audience. Um, the first question comes with a bit of a preamble. Uh, the Great Lakes are one of America's most precious natural resources. Um, they provide drinking water for more than 30 million people, more than one and a half million jobs in the region, and recreational opportunities for the nation. Um, here in Ohio, Lake Erie is especially important to, to the quality of life for millions of folks who live near the lake. Yet Lake Erie and the other Great Lakes are so suffering. So we have a bit of a problem. They can probably hear you but quite you well, but I can't. Okay. I, was <laughs> so I don't know how we're going to fix this, because I think when the sound is coming back at me, it's garbled. Why don't I move to the You'll center? You'll just hand me the questions? And, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pick the ones I want to answer. Here we go. <laughs> is this any better? That is better. All right. You know what? I can do that right like this. I will talk at you rather than them. How's that? I think it's the way it's coming through the sound system. So when you spoke closer to the mic, okay. it was a little bit better. So you don't want to answer questions that you can't hear? No, I'm happy <laughs> to answer questions I can't hear. I'll just say what I want. <laughs> I, I can live with that. Okay. Uh, yet Lake Erie and the other Great Lakes um, are, suffer serious threats such as toxic pollution, sewage pollution, invasive species and habitat loss that have led to, to many dam much damage. Um, illnesses um, in people, algal blooms, record beach closings, fish consumption warnings, and billions of dollars of economic damage. In response, citizens, agencies, and governments from across the region and the nation developed a comprehensive restoration plan, and then both parties have taken action to implement it and fund it through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. If, here's the question part, if re-elected president Will President Obama maintain, decrease, or increase the current funding levels for Great Lakes restoration funding in his budget? Well, again, I think, oh, wow, now I hear myself quite loud. Um, 
I think what we need to look at is the president's record here. It is a strong record. Obviously, we're about to have a big debate in Washington post-election, whether that's uh, in the, you know, the November, December, January, February time frame remains to be seen about, you know, uh, budget and balancing our budget and deficits and things like that. But the president has a very strong record, and I think it is very fair to assume he will continue this commitment, he will continue uh, to build on it. I think it's important to understand that the opponents in this election, Mr. Romney and Mr. Ryan, uh, the only sort of budget they have out there is Mr. Ryan's budget, which would cut programs across the board a significant percent. And as far as I know, I'm not aware of any promise or commitment they've made specifically on uh, this program. Uh, but you know, the, the, the president does understand the importance of the Great Lakes. He is from this region and I think has provided really important leadership and will continue to provide that leadership. If I can ask a follow-up, mm -hmm. we heard early in this conference about the fiscal cliff that's facing um, the nation at the end of this year. I, we were told it was sequestration, the annual budget, and, and lifting the debt ceiling. Um, given those pressures, um, will President Obama be able to protect Great Lakes funding? Well, you know, the president each year in his budget thus far has uh, protected and sought uh, money for Great Lakes restoration. Um, obviously, this is going to be a very difficult conversation that the country is going to engage in. But I think it's fair to say when you look at his record, his commitment has been very, very uh, strong. You know, how this issue gets resolved and how individual cuts or broad cuts are managed uh, will be different depending on who wins this election. I mean, you know, people like to say elections matter. When it comes to an issue like this, elections really matter. Um, and the president has a demonstrated record on these issues. Thank you. Uh, our, my next question, at least, um, again, a bit of a preamble, and I'll stand close to the mic so you can hear it. One of the most pressing threats to the health of the Great Lakes is the monstrous non-native Asian carp, uh, the invasive species of fish that breed like mosquitoes and eat like hogs. I have to call out Jeff Alexander for providing that phrase, which has now made it nationally all over the place. Wait, say it again. I have to learn this. You, you need to, this is the invasive species of fish that breed like mosquitoes and eat like hogs. I don't know a lot about hogs being from Florida, but I know a lot about mosquitoes, okay. so I get it. Despite various government efforts, these fish have used the Chicago canals as a kind of invasive superhighway, traveling from the Mississippi River through the canals to within several miles of Lake Michigan. At the same time, those canals are carrying other invasive species like zebra mussels from the Great Lakes to the rest of the country. If elected president, what re-elected president, I'm sorry, what will President Obama do to effectively and permanently stop the advance of Asian carp? Well, the president will build on the work that he's already done, which I think is, 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 is quite noteworthy. Um, he has demonstrated a commitment to maintaining, to restoring a healthy ecosystem. Obviously, Asian carp are not a part of a healthy uh, ecosystem. He's established the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating uh, Committee. He's appointed uh, an individual within the White House in CEQ to oversee the activities um, that the uh, administration is undertaking uh, with respect to the Asian Carp. He has provided funding that had not been uh, previously uh, funded. And as I mentioned earlier, he has asked that the Army Corps of Engineers and the other federal agencies involved in the current study expedite. Uh, that study so that we can get those results and make some uh, additional decisions going forward. Thank you. I've got one follow-up question for that, too, um, which I, I know you know is coming. Um, it involves um, the term hydrologic separation. And um, specifically, we, we have to ask whether the President will order various government agencies to take the necessary measures to construct a permanent barrier to separate hydrologically the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes Basin in Chicago. Well, I mean, as, as, as you all know, that is part of what is now being looked at, and it wouldn't be appropriate for anybody to prejudge uh, the outcome. You know, one of the things I learned running the largest uh, environmental agency uh, in the country is that you want to make your decisions based on the best available information, based on the best available uh, science. And so that process is underway uh, right now. I have the utmost confidence that the president will take the results of that process very, very seriously. 
seriously. Uh, but it's not, it, it, you know, it, the president, I think, said this yesterday in an interview, obviously, on a different issue, that, you know, when you're in office, you have to take very seriously the requirements of the office and the way in which you use your authority, and you have to con comply with the law and the, and in and, and, and all of its intents. You know, when you're not in office, you're free to sort of say whatever you want. In this case, the president is taking the issue seriously. He's ordered the study. He's ordered it expedited, and he needs to allow the results of that study uh, to come forward so that we can all make an informed decision about how best to proceed. You know, I, I mean, I'll just add on this side. You know, there were lots of times during my tenure at EPA when I might have personally wanted to do something, but as the statutory head of the agency, as someone you know confirmed by the United States Senate, nominated by a president, confirmed by the Senate. Um, you're not free to do that. You, 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 are, uh, you, you must follow the laws of the country, and those laws are important, and they're how we've been able to make the kind of progress we've made in terms of environmental protection, clean water, uh, clean air uh, in this country. And, and so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's easier probably to be a candidate in an election season, uh, or a candidate not currently in office, than it is to be a candidate uh, in office. But the president does uh, take his responsibilities towards the Great Lakes very seriously. Great. So um, we are now going to audience questions. How will your administration promote the growth of green jobs and industry in the United States that will develop technologies that can be applied to Great Lakes restoration and protection in the future? Well, I think there, that um, the administration has already demonstrated um, a willingness to, to do two things that are important to technology technological advancements in terms of protecting the Great Lakes writ large. One is obviously the investment of, of federal dollars, and whether that be in the form of particular initiatives around the Asian carp, whether it be funding for uh, the Great Lake um, issues more broadly, whether it be, be funding uh, for things like um, new technologies so that our cars are more efficient and less polluting. You know, the administration has been willing uh, to put a fair amount of resources into the funding of new, greener uh, technologies. The second thing an administration can do, and I already mentioned, is set standards. And when you set, for example, a mercury standard, what that does is it creates opportunities for new technologies to come forward. Uh, for those uh, businesses, for those smokestacks that emit mercury, they have a choice now. They can shut that facility down, or they can install new, greener, cleaner technology to reduce their pollution. And you know, a lot of times you'll hear folks say, well, regulations are just bad for the economy. I can show you any number of businesses that exist today because the government created an environmental requirement and they had the solution. And with that governmental requirement to reduce pollution, that company was able to come forward and sell their um, technology. And so I think that you know uh, we, we need to continue to be um, take advantage of all of the tools that are available to, to the government in terms of stimulating private sector investments in new technologies and, and, and really bringing to bear the very best of, of, of our country in terms of common sense, cost effective solutions. Thanks. Um, we've got another one that's about the public investment now. Um, infrastructure across our country, bridges, roads, water, and sewer lines are in terrible shape. Many older cities, especially those bordering our Great Lakes, were built with combined sewers. The cost to reduce combined sewer overflows, or CSOs, is staggering. The price tag here in Northeast Ohio was $3 billion, paid mostly by the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District ratepayers. What can the federal do government do to lessen this financial burden on Ohioans, yet protect our waterways from sewage discharges? So I think it's important to, to understand that the federal government has been funding the construction of wastewater treatment facilities um, initially through grants going back, I want to say, 30 years ago, um, more recently through the revolving loan problem, uh, program. Uh, probably for the last 20 years. So what happens is every year money flows from the federal government, from the EPA, to each state based on your population. States are then free to use that money to um, build wastewater treatment facilities. One of the changes I got in the laws, you can use that money to prevent uh, pollution uh, from entering your, your waterways. Uh, we also created a drinking water revolving loan problem. What many states have done, I don't happen to know Ohio, is they take those federal dollars and they multiply 
multiply them through a bond program. So they leverage it. So you know, for every dollar they get from the feds, they're able to turn it into two, three, four dollars, which they can then loan to local governments to allow them the capital they need to improve the quality of the sewer system, of that drinking water um, system. And then that loan is paid back. Now here's what's important. It's paid back to the state government, not to the federal government, and then that money can be relent. And so the um, Wastewater Revolving Loan Fund is now revolving nationally at billions of dollars. And you know, just even with that level of, of revolving funds, there continue to be monies flowing, uh, new monies flowing into uh, the state accounts. And as I mentioned, a similar uh, fund was uh, we were able to create while I was at EPA with the support of Congress uh, for drinking water. And so, yes, infrastructure is a serious problem. Uh, yes, Yes, there are dollars, there continue uh, to be dollars, but you know, this is the kind of, of debate we're about to have in Washington is what will those levels of funding uh, be going forward? Thank you. We have, we have time for one more question, um, and here it is, your favorite topic. Climate change is a serious threat to the health of the Great Lakes and the people who rely on them. What is the President's plan to address climate change in his next term? Can we just start with what the president said about climate change in his acceptance speech? I mean, you know, he said, look, this is real. This is serious. We need to be about doing something. He said earlier in a, a State of the Union, he said, you may not believe what I, the president, believe about climate change. Even if you don't, there are still reasons to invest in clean energy technologies. Now, the president does believe climate change is real. I believe it's real. I believe it's probably the biggest, most difficult issue our generation faces. Um, the president has already taken significant steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The mercury rule that I mentioned, the requirement to reduce mercury from coal-fired power plants, the effect of that mercury requirement is also to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. He's been working through the Department of Energy so that when you go to buy an appliance in the next couple of years, it will be significantly more efficient than the appliance you're creating further reducing greenhouse gases. And finally, uh, the car rule. One of the things I was able to be a part of uh, during my tenure at the White House was bringing together uh, two agencies, uh, the EPA, the Department of Transportation, all of the car companies, the state of California who can set their own fuel efficiency standards. And not only did we create a national program for fuel efficiency and the most stringent efficiency standards ever, but we also set the first ever greenhouse gas emission standards uh, for cars. And the administration uh, earlier, uh, later, the, late this summer, uh, went even further setting another round. So if you look at how the president is using his existing authorities, maybe he didn't get the legislation he wanted, he has been taking real and measurable steps that are not only good for the environment, not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but are good for consumers. The fuel efficiency car rules will save people who buy a new car money every single time they fill up at the pump. Um, obviously, uh, in the second administration, the president will have other authorities that he can bring to bear. He's proposed the first ever greenhouse gas uh, requirements for new coal-fired power plants. Uh, but I think that for those of us who believe climate change is uh, the issue of our generation, this president has a very, very solid uh, record uh, to build on in a second administration. That concludes our questions. Um, Ms. Browner, would you like, you've been talking for a while, but do we want to say anything to wrap, to wrap us up? I, you know, I would. I, um, you, know, you, you know, I ran the EPA, and um, one of the reasons we created an EPA, an Environmental Protection Agency, uh, in this country was in part uh, a response to what was happening across the nation in terms of pollution, and obviously for uh, the, the, the photos, the sort of iconic photos of the Cuyahoga River catching on fire uh, was certainly something that compelled a lot of people uh, to demand that the then President Richard Nixon create this federal um, agency. And the reason I, I bring up what I'm sure for people who are actually here from Cleveland, a somewhat painful memory, is on the drive-in, the gentleman driving me, a lovely uh, man, 
uh, is a rower, it turns out. And there's a regatta here this weekend in the Cuyahoga River. And I thought, what a testament to what our commitment to environmental protection can mean. And you know, we've made a lot of progress in protecting our air and water, but the job isn't done. And in a modern industrial world, we have to remain committed and vigilant. And there is no doubt in my mind that that's what President Obama uh, stands for. But as he said in his acceptance speech at the Democratic Convention, he can't do it alone. He needs all of us to help him. And so let me uh, end where I began by thanking you uh, for what it is uh, you do as committed environmental leaders, but not only for what you have done, but for what you will do so that we can give to subsequent generations uh, clean air, uh, clean water, and a restored Great Lakes. Thank you all so much. Thank you. So now I'm going to have to sit here for 30 minutes. Thank you, Ms. Browner. And you've been watching the Presidential Candidate Forum here at Great Lakes Week on the last day of the conference. And joining me now is Gary Wilson, commentator from the Great Lakes Echo. Um, very interesting, this Presidential Candidates Forum was supposed to be a representative from the Obama administration and a representative from the Romney campaign. And it really seemed like at the, at the last minute, I know that there was some last minute wrangling, the Romney campaign did not send anyone. What does this say, or do the, is it really pretty much say volumes about their stance on Great Lakes issues, or do you give them the benefit of the doubt that there was some kind of logistical issue? I, I'm, I'm no benefit of the doubt on this one. You know, at conferences like this, a lot of things go on. There are a lot of uh, events and policy discussions and, and seminars. There's rarely a wow event. Oh my gosh, this, you know, this, mm -hmm. this happened. Mm -hmm. You know, if, it, if this conference had a wow event, this was it. I thought for sure that the Romney campaign would send somebody. Uh, and I don't know if it speaks volumes by them not sending somebody, but I think it was a big, uh, a big mistake. Uh, nobody can say what uh, a new president or the existing president is going to do, but here in Ohio and in the Great Lakes region, not to just send somebody to at least express their concern there's a message there, and I think they made a mistake. Carol Browner, former head of the EPA, was the one who was just speaking right now with Andy Buxbaum um, and representing the Obama administration. Um, she was she was pretty much preaching preaching to the room that that uh, liked her. Yes, and uh, she is. Uh, I, I said uh, off camera. I said she's playing with house money. She doesn't have a, she doesn't have an opponent, so she she was able to uh, you know really bring home a message. Uh, you know, they sent a, a high-ranking person. They didn't send, you know, some unknown staffer to, to carry the message. And I, and I think there's a message in that, too. She was well-received. Uh, did she answer? Um, did she answer the questions to your the best of? Um, she answered them the best of her ability. That's not what I'm saying. Did right. she give you enough? Do you think? Well, she she took a little bit of license. Uh, the moderator, Andy Buxbaum, asked her about the uh, the clean water funds. Uh, and, how, and she kind of went through, took us through a, a path of how that's funded. What she didn't say was uh, due to the budget cuts that we've, we've been talking about for the last few days, uh, there was a significant cut in that, you know, I think about $500 million uh, that a lot of the environmental folks have been fighting to get reinstated. So she kind of sidestepped that one, but you know, it is what it is. You know, really can candidates make blanket promises that no. yes, when they get into office, I guarantee I'm going to give you $300 million for Great Lakes restoration, even though the Obama administration has been giving each year and through Congress, they've been, they've been voting to keep up the Great Lake restoration initiative. They can't promise what they're able to do. No, they can't. And I thought she handled that very well. What you have to look at is the track record of the person, in this case, the president, and the president's uh, track records cut both ways. You know, whatever they did is, you know, is, is quantifiable, so you can see. So then you kind of measure the character of the person and say, well, what are they likely to do? Uh, is he likely to do a 180? No, I don't think so. Now, he has to deal with Congress, mm -hmm. and who knows what that will be. Uh, the House of Representatives is on a mission to cut money. Uh, their, the budget that they've proposed for next year already cuts Great Lakes Restoration money by $50 million. We'll see how that plays out as it gets to the Senate. But no, the, candidate, the president can't, can't promise a candidate 
can't promise because they they don't have the ability to get to deliver. Healing Our Waters Coalition did a uh, did a survey, did a poll earlier on in May, and that's what I was searching for on my computer. I was <laughs> listening to you, but I'm like, wait a minute, I want to get a hold of these numbers. That a large majority of Ohio voters, 72% of them, support continuing Great Lakes restoration funding. Uh, rather than reducing that. That is a significant amount. And also that the support is bipartisan, that 63% of Republicans voted to keep that restoration funding. And of course, 79% of Democrats, 72% of independents. So this isn't really a partisan issue when you're living along the basin that you want to make sure that the funding is available, especially now looking at Lake Erie and the issues that they're talking about in terms of algae blooms and the, and the phosphate runoff and how are you going to stop that and what kind of money do you have to put into that for programs and enforcement to make sure that that cuts back? Well, Christy, you brought up something that's uh, very relevant to this point uh, a day or so ago. Uh, sure, if you ask people, uh, you know, do you support clean water? Do you want Every, the, Everybody says yes, yeah, sure. Do you, want the, do you want the beaches uh, free of algae, all those types of things? And then you start putting a price tag to it and you say, okay, we can do this and it's going to cost this much. Now, you've, that's the hard question. I don't know if that was part of, uh, of the survey. But uh, I forget at what point you had brought up the other day. Well, how much are you willing to pay for this? Well, maybe, maybe not, maybe this much, but maybe not that much. That's the test. Mm -hmm. And they do have some numbers on that. But you're right; it does change. It does change a little bit. Thirty-seven percent say the government needs to focus on the creating jobs. That that's where the money needs to go, reducing yeah. the federal budget deficit, and that the Great Lakes should take a cut along with everything else. But 54% said no, that clean drinking water, that's the, the important thing, and we need to make sure that that funding stays up there. But you're right, there is a little bit of change when push comes to shove and people say, look, is it something that's gonna affect me right now or something happening somewhere along the Great Lakes Basin, I might go for something that's happening right in my and, backyard. And that, and that goes back to the discussion we've been having with, uh, you've, you've interviewed a number of people about the physical separation of uh, the Great Lakes from the Mississippi uh, in the, along the Chicago waterway mm -hmm. system. And you know the two numbers, four and seven billion dollars. Uh, next year, when push comes to shove, we're going to find out if people have the stomach to put up that kind of money to, to do that. And a massive change of infrastructure. And it's a mm -hmm. great segue because Carol Browner did talk a little bit about Asian carp um, and about the physical separation. Um, Andy Buxbaum did ask her about where the Obama administration stands, and she said that. They need to wait for all the studies to come in, and that's what we've been talking about. The <laughs> Army Corps of Engineers has to finish their study. They finished their study. They'll present it uh, to Congress, and who knows what will happen there. It's going to get a robust uh, debate. Uh, these the folks here are going to make sure of that, and uh, I just don't know how it's going to play out. I could argue it both ways. I, I interviewed Peter Annan a few years ago, um, uh, author of Great Lakes Water Wars, one of the great books about the region. And it just so happened we were on the banks of the Chicago River. Mm -hmm. And at the end, as, as a toss away question, I kind of said, I said, Peter, do you ever think that uh, the, the Chicago River will be re reversed? And he kind of looked at me like, hmm. He said, mm, you know, I, that's, that's a lot of money, and uh, I just don't see it in the future. Well, a few years later, we don't know if it's going to happen or not, but it's being talked about, and it's being talked about by serious people. It is being talked about, and it's it is turning into a, a debate. People are starting to kind of line up on the sides of it because of the fact that it is getting closer to what could be reality. So let's go ahead and take a look at the question of hydrological separation between Lake Michigan and the Mississippi River Basin and potentially keeping out the Asian carp. Here on the Illinois River, about 30 miles south of Chicago, is ground zero of the latest invasive species debate, whether or not to spend untold billions of dollars separating the Great Lakes from the Mississippi River Basin. We're approaching the electric barriers that have been in place since 2002. Dell Wilkins operates a barge business on the Illinois. The fish barriers are working and that the controls weren't being adequate at this far and doing their function to stop the advancement of invasive species, not only from the inland waterways coming into the Great Lakes environment, but also from the Great Lakes environment going into the inland waterways. Frankly, having that technology in place doesn't make me sleep better at night. It's a good interim solution. It does a good job of repelling fish, but we're, we need something in the Great Lakes that we can bank on for generations to come. And I'm banking on the separation of the Great Lakes from the Mississippi River. Debate over building a physical barrier which would interrupt commercial barge traffic started mainly because of this. Asian carp, the frenetic flying poster fish for all invasive species on a seeming quest to scare anyone who encounters them out of their wits, if not their boats. They're a real danger. These are big fish. 
these are, are uh, oftentimes 60 pound fish and there have been some, some scary and unfortunate instances where they've hit people, uh, broken bones, knocked people unconscious. As dangerous and scary as Asian carp can be above the water surface, they're even more devastating beneath it. Underneath the water, Asian carp are great at eating. They can scoop up to 20% of their body weight out of the water per day, and what they do is they eat right at the base of the food web. It's the fear of Asian carp's next destination that has galvanized advocates for separation. They're swimming north towards the Great Lakes through the Mississippi River, the Illinois River, and they're coming very close to us here in Chicago. And it is in Chicago where the proponents of separation would like this fish story to take a sharp turn, literally at the convergence of the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River. It used to be that water flowed from the Chicago area into Lake Michigan. At around the turn of the 20th century, around 1900, the water was reversed so that now Lake Michigan drains into the Chicago River down to the Mississippi. At the time, the reversal of the Chicago River, still considered one of the greatest engineering feats in American history, was necessary for a very good reason. To protect the drinking water supply for the city of Chicago. It used to be that their waste was all flushed into Lake Michigan. Well, they wanted to separate their waste from their drinking water for obvious health reasons, and, um, and so the river was reversed. So now you've got this free-flowing canal between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River. Great for getting rid of Chicago's waste, great for transportation in the 19th century, but it's also opened up this highway for Asian carp to move up the Illinois River toward Lake Michigan. So the idea is to build a permanent barrier to separate, to restore the natural divide, the natural watershed divide that existed uh, prior to the 1900s. For its advocates, the barrier would not only solve the invasive species problem, but also provide an opportunity to focus on improving the Chicago waterway itself. It is not a modern waterway. It is not a modern transportation system. What we're talking about with this idea of a physical barrier is rethinking Chicago's waterway, modernizing it. Increased property values, clean water, better recreation, more people on the river, and yes, grow commercial transportation in a way that makes sense for Illinois and Chicago. We always need people who want to look forward and um, there's absolutely no reason for us not to do so. Kay Nelson represents an array of industries in the state of Indiana and has been engaged in Great Lakes issues for over 30 years. My concern is that I've expressed multiple times in settings is that the general public has the impression that this is the fast fix to prevent the Asian carp from migrating into the Great Lakes. And it's not something that's going to happen within the next 18 to 24 months. And other critical factors need to be considered before any barrier can become a reality, such as now dumping the treated wastewater and the combined sewer overflow discharges back into Lake Michigan, where Chicago residents get their drinking water. Meanwhile, Dell Wilkins and thousands of others who work along the Chicago Waterway are focused on making a living right now. If we shut down locks or we separate a system, you know, we're forced to have to, to shut down our, our operations. Because if we shut down our operations, I mean, we, we're putting people out of work and we're losing jobs. We move coal, petroleum products, chemical industry products, road salt, ice control salt, sand, gravels cement, steel, and steel byproducts, and right now we're moving upwards of 25 to 30 million tons annually within the greater Chicago land area. There's 16 billion dollars worth of product that go through the waterway system. Mark Beal represents the chemical industry in Illinois and is also chairman of Unlock Our Jobs, a group focused on keeping the Chicago waterway system open. The folks who depend on the waterway system don't want the Asian carp in the Great Lakes. I mean, that's the last thing in the world we want. We want to be part of the solution. Um, what we have said is we think there's a lot of ways to solve this issue short of separating the, the, the waterway system so that it, you, know, you, you, you cause, cause economic harm to those folks that depend on it. I think everybody wants to be part of the solution, but it's going to come down of what part of the solution is going to be best for them. And there are many people that don't believe that you have to go all the way to that separation, that there can be different kind of barriers to, to be put up. But you have a large chorus of people saying Hy hydrological separation is the only way to keep Asian carp out. Yeah, this was an interesting segment that I was, I'm, I'm glad to see it. 
what you had there really the, the two extremes of the issue, uh, Joel Brammeyer and Josh Morgerman representing the, uh, Joel with the Alliance for the Great Lakes and Josh with the uh, Natural Resources Defense Council representing the environmental group uh, position and then Kay Nelson from Northwest Indiana Business Group and Mark Beal representing the chemical industry. They're at the opposite end of the sp spectrum uh, representing industry. And they really don't have a lot, I, I, I follow this all the time in Chicago, mm -hmm. they don't have a lot of common ground. Uh, and they're really talking past each other. Uh, and then you've got Dale Wilkins representing the barge industry. You know, he's kind of really caught in the middle. I mean, that's his livelihood, that's what he does. So these are, these are, tough, these are tough questions. And uh, I, boy, if I could just put them all in the, in the room and say, you know, get it, guys, no talking points allowed. Get yeah. in there and just talk about some things about how we do this, yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I would say that people are more educated about the Asian carp issue or they know that there's a problem coming. They may not know all the specifics or, you know, how exactly how it would decimate um, fishing and other wildlife in the, in the Great Lakes Basin, but it feels in terms of environmental issues, which sometimes the general public is not totally keyed on, right. that there has been a lot of discussion about this for years and people now are waiting and saying, okay, well, where's, where's the end game here? And we won't maybe see it for another year and a half? At the earliest. At the earliest. earliest. We are coming up now, approaching three years since the eDNA samples were found beyond uh, the electrical barrier. And uh, uh, here we are three years later and we're kind of no closer to uh, a, a solution if there is one uh, than we were then. And that was, you know, that made headlines. I can tell you in Chicago, every station carried some version of that story for a week. You don't get the TV stations uh, in, in any major city picking up on an environmental story unless it's some type of a, a major disaster. Right. You know, you get, you get two and a half minutes if that. That's just sometimes how local news goes, yeah, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> you, you should know that. Yeah, I do. So <laughs> it, it's, um, it's the story that's maintained the, the traction, you know, well beyond what I thought it would be. Do you think that the pressure now, because of there had been the lawsuits from the various states, from the various attorneys general to try to get the Army Corps to shut down the lock saying it was a public nuisance, okay, well that didn't go in the court, and then they tried to get them to move up the study. Finally, Congress did say in July, you've got to move, you've got to get the deadline for this study um, come out a little bit quicker, and that was just even like two months after the Corps themselves said, so gonna do we're going to move up our deadline <laughs> because there's been a lot of heat, a lot of heat on us. Is it going to be quiet now for the next um, for the next year until the study comes out I, I don't think that there can be any more kind of poking and prodding or if there is some kind of discovery this thing's gonna blow well, up. Well if there's a discovery then you know then you it, it will blow up but I don't think it's gonna be quiet uh, the, these these groups are very good very skilled on both sides at keeping the message out there and keeping the uh, keeping the pressure on on their, their, their politicians their, their you know their, their supporters uh, the, law, the lawsuit is still pending. That's not over yet. Now, as the legal experts I talk to, they say the state of Michigan and the other states, they've got a, they've got a tough road ahead. But, and I've been talking with people trying to find out what the, what the state of Michigan's end game is here. Mm -hmm. Do they want to win in court or do they just want to keep the pressure on and nobody really has a, has an answer for that. You're from Michigan. You can. I'm gonna get a little intel on that. Yeah. D does uh, does the the infighting or uh, not a lot of it, but do the the legal wrangling like this uh, involving the various states, which now seem to be lined up versus Indiana and Illinois, right. does this affect? how um, they can all come together on other Great Lakes issues? Will the Asian carp issue fracture the good relationships that the basin has tried to maintain as a whole? Boy, I, you know, on, on two fronts there, I don't think there's a lot of collaboration between the governors when it comes to the economy and jobs. Everybody's trying to pirate companies away yeah, from everybody get else. Get for your own, right? Yeah. The, uh, on, on, the, on the Asian carp issue, the, the governors, they're going to keep it pretty close to the vest until they have to really make a commitment. And, uh, you know, the can got kicked down the road here until the end of 2013, early 2014. And uh, I don't think they're going to 
they're going to put their chips on the table until they absolutely have to. Yeah, we'll be watching, and I'm sure we'll still be right. talking about it. Gary Wilson, commentator of the Great Lakes Echo, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I know we'll talk a little bit later on this afternoon as we uh, continue to wrap up Great Lakes Week. I'll be here. You've enjoyed, right? Yeah, I've, have, I've enjoyed. <laughs> I'm running on adrenaline here today. <laughs> exactly. It made you sit at the desk for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we appreciate it. We appreciate that you're continuing to watch our coverage of Great Lakes Week. We will be right back. The Generation Foundation is proud to be an underwriter of Great Lakes Now. Based in Cleveland, the foundation makes grants throughout Northeast Ohio to nonprofits that can improve both the economy and quality of life in the region. Most grants support startup organizations working in some area of sustainability, like alternative energy, local food, water issues, and environmental restoration. More information at generationfoundation.org. The Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, like other clean water agencies along our Great Lakes, is dedicated to protecting our water resources, public health, and the environment. We are the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, and we're keeping our Great Lake great. Learn more at neorsd.org or join us at facebook.com slash your sewer district. ArcelorMittal is a global steelmaker with operations in the U.S. and Canada. Recognizing the importance of the Great Lakes to our business and communities, ArcelorMittal is a proud partner in Sustain Our Great Lakes. Sustain Our Great Lakes is led by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, with support from ArcelorMittal and five federal agencies, generating a total conservation investment of $58.6 million since 2006. SustainOurGreatLakes.org Take some time for a two-lane adventure. Wander along the shores of Lake Erie. Discover whistle-stop towns with the Canal Era past. Take in the beauty of big sky days. Rolling Hill Farms, the serenity of Amish country. From big city lights to charming riverbank towns. Experience Ohio's culture and history one byway at a time. Ohio Byways, 27 paths to discover our state. Learn more at ohiobyways.com. Welcome back to our live coverage of Great Lakes Week on GreatLakesNow.org or on your PBS station, wherever you are in the Great Lakes Basin. Welcome. It is day four of the week, and we are glad that you are joining us. We're going to talk a little bit about waste and what that means when it comes to pollution of the Great Lakes. There's different ways in dealing with waste and dealing with our wastewater systems, and we've got a, a, a story about a different way to deal with the waste around the Great Lakes. Nobody likes to point fingers at American farmers. Agriculture's had a real wide berth in America for a lot of years, but things have changed. Nor has it ever been popular to single out excessive fertilizer use as the main cause for Lake Erie's algal woes. But today's agricultural practices leave little doubt and few choices for the farmer. The strength of fertilizers, the application rates, uh, the, the need to, to turn crops over faster or more crops in a year all require real aggressive positions for, for farmers. This is Quasar Energy's founder and president, Mel Kurtz. And the result sometimes is a compromise in, in the environment. Mel comes from a long line of Kurtzes who know a thing or two about keeping soil fertile. For years, the family operated the Akron compost facility and the responsibility was to take all of their sewage sludge solids and convert them to compost. So he understands all too well the nexus between food production and lake health. People call it nutrient management. Most of us call it nutrient mismanagement. Phosphorus and nitrogen are what feed the algae in these lakes. So you add sun to the plant life that's already in the lakes or streams with nutrient rich phosphorus and nitrogen, voila, we have lakes you can't use we have lakes with toxic algae that kill animals, fish, and, and are harmful to humans. But for him, fertilizer and stormwater management are surface problems. At the root of it all is the lack of alternatives for those actually getting their hands dirty. If you tell a farmer you can't use phosphorus because it's going to be runoff and you have no proposed alternative, well, what's he do? Okay, so he stops growing his crops and we stop eating. That doesn't work so well. Behind Mel is his alternative. A solution not only for farmers and cleaning up Lake Erie, but an answer for sustainable energy and controlling greenhouse gas emissions. 
It's called an anaerobic biodigester. It's like a cow's stomach. This is Quasar's plant operator, James Robinson. James alone runs the bioenergy plant here in East Cleveland. We take in organic waste and we run it through a process of anaerobic digestion to create methane gas. And the methane gas is then used to create electricity and also power vehicles. Up to 250 homes get their electricity from the methane created by bacteria as it devours all the waste that we'd normally shove down a trash compactor, flush away, or dump in a landfill. It could be byproducts from food manufacturing, could be manure from farms, it could be fat soils and grease, sewage sludge, municipal uh, waste streams, could be from baseball parks, football stadiums. In fact, this tanker is offloading grease waste from a couple of well-known big box stores. But electricity and CNG is only part of the story. What the bacteria can't convert into methane gas gets processed into fertilizer. Fertilizer without phosphorus, a key ingredient of harmful algae blooms. We've been working on for over a year to separate the phosphorus from the liquid stream that allows us to take the phosphorus where we need it and stop putting it on where we don't need it. Along with conservation and restoration programs, farmers now have another tool to combat algae feeding runoff. The cow eats the grain, the manure comes to the digester, the food came from the cow, and now we're going back to digesting it, and the nutrients that went through the cycle already is gonna to return to that cycle again. From fertilizer to food to waste, and back to fertilizer again. All in one perfectly sustainable loop. A possible solution for America's growing need for more energy, fresh water, and food. Next time you go to the grocery store and you get those big, beautiful vegetables or fruits or stuff like that, it may be a product of Quasar Bioenergy. Just an interesting and different solution. We're going to take you now to a town hall meeting that the International Joint Commission did in making sure that people from the public get an opportunity to talk to them about some of the regulation. The International Joint Commission is a joint group between the U.S. and Canada. So let's go ahead and take a listen. Sorry, Christy Meyer from the Ohio Environmental Council. Joel sparked a thought in my head. So the Lake Erie Lamp has identified some nutrient um, loading targets. And I'm just, and I heard you guys talk about how you don't have authority, and I recognize that you don't have authority to really require the states to meet those standards. And I guess I, you know, for a couple of years I've been trying to figure out how the International Joint Commission and, and the LAMPs are going to work with the states and the provinces to really ensure that we are meeting these targets. And I haven't really got a, a good answer. I haven't gotten any answer. So I'm wondering if you guys could give me an answer. OK. Chair Pollock would like to answer your question, Christy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I've stated uh, several times just since Friday uh, that it's really uh, the will of the people in two great democracies uh, that will determine whether these lakes will be better protected or not at all protected or, 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 or will stumble along. Um, we will advise and hopefully we will do a good job not only in, in, in the science behind our advice, but we will also, um, I hope, do a good job working with any number of, of um, agencies, governments, uh, provincial, state, uh, watershed, uh, as, as well as the uh, public and NGOs. And it's collectively how clear and how forceful we are that will determine whether governments who do have the authority to do this act. Uh, it, it's not going to be easy, but one thing that, that, and I speak for myself personally and, and perhaps for my colleagues, only perhaps, uh, I'm very impatient when people say we can't afford to protect the lakes. We can't afford not to protect the lakes. Look at the, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that we're spending uh, to try and clean up the AOCs, and the AOCs, uh, the areas of concern, which were designated 40 of them, I think, uh, they're not even the whole story. So to say what we cannot afford it is, is it's an ignorant statement. Uh, 
and uh, the IJC is, is, is going, to, uh, going to repeatedly offer good advice, but how well we are heard will depend very much on everybody in this audience uh, and well beyond. It, 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 I'm, a, I'm a recovering politician, <laughs> and I know what moves politicians, and it's, it's public pressure. So if the public understands and the public speaks out, the politicians, the electeds in both countries and at all levels will be responsive. If the public is indifferent or appears to be indifferent or is confused and, and, and offers bad advice that can't be backed up, then the government, it's easy to, it's easy to ignore a lot of flailing around and bad advice that's not well-based. It's harder to, to ignore well-founded 